All right. <coughs> Any questions about anything from last lectures or anything else? Or logistics of the course? You're all doing the uh, at least twice a week readings and submitting them to the class email account, I hope. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, breakout sessions on Monday nights. One was last night. Uh, how many attended the breakout sessions so far, the Monday nights? Good. Hopefully it's uh, helping. At least we've got some pizza, so can't go wrong with that. Uh, last time we left off with uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, uh, a.k.a. Prince of Mathematics. He published so many things. He made such an impact on mathematics, and when he passed away, his colleagues and students went through his belongings, in his closets, and they found hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, papers that he wrote that he never published. He just stuck them in a closet because he didn't think they were good enough. And so for decades, they published his papers posthumously. It's amazing. So after he died, he was still publishing for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And some of these papers ushered in whole new branches of mathematics. So they were really, really good. But that shows you how impactful, how uh, brilliant this guy was. And he made also contributions to almost every field other than mathematics as well, astronomy and optics and electromagnetism. Many things are named after him. Gaussian distribution, which is a normal curve. That's, that's his. Uh, Gaussian elimination, solving linear equations using matrices. Gaussian noise, that's white noise. That's named after him. Dozens of things bear his name. Degaussing, that is demagnetizing something like erasing a hard drive or degaussing something from static electricity like a ship or a plane, and of course he has the Gauss named after him, the unit of magnetic field strength. And some of his students were amazing mathematicians in their own right, like Dedekind and Riemann and others. Uh, in uh, Germany, he's on the money. Uh, in fact, the Gaussian distribution is on the money too, with the equation, which is kind of amazing. I always love it when you have real equations, real math on currency bills, as, to, as opposed to more mundane stuff like politicians. Uh, and so this is the normal curve. Of course, uh, later they switched to euros, but before that, the money was more interesting there. And he gets a lot of uh, credit for his uh, discoveries, uh, and a lot of things are built on top of his, his work. He has this huge impact crater on the moon named after him. He appears on stamps. Uh, a later contemporary of his, Hamilton, a uh, very brilliant mathematician, contributed to many fields of mathematics and physics, uh, formulated so-called Hamiltonian mechanics, which generalizes Newtonian mechanics in certain ways, and discovered quaternions. Quaternions are a generalization of the complex numbers, just like complex numbers are a generalization of the reals. So the reals, any point on a number line, has a real number associated with it, like pi or e or 2 or minus 1. But now we had, later on, introduced the imaginary unit i, which is the square root of minus 1. So we had a plus bi, imaginary numbers. Well, he generalized that even more. So in his system, there's i and j and k as well. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. And many other things, Hamiltonian paths and graphs, which are cycles that visit every node once. They're hard to find. It's an NP-complete problem. Uh, he also ushered in uh, quantum theory and uh, vector algebra and did some work on relativity as well, or pre precursor to relativity, I should say, upon which Einstein has built his own theory of relativity on. And here's the multiplication table of the quaternion. So we've got i, the square root of minus 1, and also minus i. And that's a multiplication table, products. And also you have j and k. And j and k are not the same as i, although they're squares are all minus 1. So you have minus 1 going down the diagonal. So i squared is minus 1, so is j squared, so is k squared. But they're not the same as each other. And multiplication here is not commutative, interestingly enough. Um, and legend has it he's, he discovered this type of algebra or number system while working on this on bridge here. So the bridge has this inscription on it commemorating that moment. And quaternions are not just some hypothetical abstract thing. They, they're used very heavily in very practical scenarios like graphics. So when you play video games, if you play a video game and it has any kind of graphics, you should thank this guy because the graphics rely heavily on quaternions, which are generalization of the imaginary numbers. So multiplication is not commutative again. So i times j is equal to k, but j times i is equal to minus k. And it's, um, you know, it took us a long time to discover this system. And he discovered it. So 
we already mentioned it's not associative, right? And there's octonians, which even generalize the quaternions. So now instead of A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, now there's eight, eight different units, which are all the square root of minus one, but not equal to each other. And so people then jumped on this generalization of Hamilton and kept generalizing it even more. Mm. And uh, here's a multiplication table for the octonians. There's eight of them now. Here's the I that we now love, but these are the, all the others. Right? And this is, again, used in general uh, relativity theory, general relativity, and quantum logic, and many other places. Uh, so it's not nothing. It's very, very practical. It's useful. And there's a famous uh, physicist who said about all this, the real numbers are the dependable breadwinner of the family. You know, we know them, we love them, we use them all the time. Uh, but then there's a complex number, a slightly flashier, but still respectable younger brother of the reals. They're not ordered. You can order complex numbers like you can the real. But they're algebraically complete. You know, complex times a complex is still a complex. <coughs> Raise them to power, you still get complex numbers. The quaternion, however, they're not commutative. They're, sort of the, they're the eccentric cousin who is shown at the important family gatherings. But the octonians are the crazy old uncle nobody lets out of the attic uh, because they're not even associative. Uh, so they get weirder and weirder. And there's even one beyond that called the sedentians. This one is not even alternative. So you lose uh, first associ commutativity, then you lose associativity, then you lose alternativity, which means that x times, x times y associated this way is not the same as x, x times y. They're not generally the same. So even that property, it's a weak version of associativity. Even that's lost. Here's the full multiplication table for sedentians, 16 by 16. And this, now we're not calling them i, j, k, because there's not enough letters. We just call them e1 through e15. You know, and then the first is just one. Um, so here are, again, the landscape of the numbers that we know and love. There's Boolean numbers, just 0 and 1, prime numbers, natural numbers. And these are denoted by these capital case letters. And the integers, the z, the, the rational is q for quotient. That's why it's q. So these are things like 2 ninths and 1 half and 5 sixths and so on. And the greens are examples. So now. We have the algebraic numbers, like square root of 2 and other numbers like that, which are not roots of polynomials. And they're not the complete irrational set, because some numbers like pi and e are not even algebraic. They're not even roots of polynomials. They're something else. They're still real numbers. But uh, this is a Venn diagram, by the way, set containment. And these are all proper sets. No, not, no two of these sets are the same. So here are the real numbers, encompassing all of that. And up to Hamilton's time, we thought that's all there is. Reals, maybe a little bit before him, because later we discovered the, the complex numbers, like 7 plus CI, for example. And then we thought that's all there is, and Hamilton showed us that there's something beyond that, the quaternions. And then very quickly, people came up with octonian sedentions, which we just saw on the previous slides. And these are more and more general number systems. Each one subsumes all the other. Just like a real is a special case of a complex where i is equal to 0. right? A complex is a special case of an octonian where the j and the k are zero terms. And Sedentian is an even more generalization, even bigger generalization of the complex, where all the terms are zero except the first two, and so on. And there's stuff beyond that. So just an example, this number is called surreal numbers, which are generalization of the reals, but not necessarily generalization of the complexes. So the Venn diagram kind of breaks sideways like that. Uh, I'll try to explain to you what a surreal number is. I'll take a deep breath first, because it's a little bit tricky if you've never seen them before. So first of all, let's talk about reals as Dedekind cuts. So you can talk, think about, and by the way, every number system here builds upon the previous one. So for example, uh, the integers are the naturals union with all the negatives of the natural. So you can define integers in terms of natural. An integer is either natural or negative of a natural. A rational is any two integers divided up as a quotient. So each one builds on the previous one. So a real number can be thought of in terms of rationals as two sets of rationals. Think about pi. Take all the rationals less than pi, put them in one set. Take all the rationals greater than pi, put them in a second set. These two sets together represent uniquely the number pi. Because everything in one set is strictly less, everything in one set is strictly more, and they're all there. All the rationals are there in one of the two sets, and they're disjoint. And together they sandwich pi right in between them. How many get this? So I defined 
a real number strictly in terms of rationals. So I'm building up from smaller types, larger and more complex types, as we always do in math and in computer science. So that's called a can cut. A DD can cut is when you chop up the set of rational numbers into two subsets that together they uniquely sandwich a real number between them, and now you can define all the reals using these cuts. Okay. How many get that? Okay. Here's the leap. To define surreal numbers, you do the same thing with a cut, except you remove the restriction that everything on the left is strictly less than everything on the right of the cut. You can intermix them. You take some subset like this and, and make a cut that's arbitrarily weird. Now you got a surreal number. It's a little hard to wrap your mind about all the implications of what I just said, but if you look at the wiki page for extra credit, you're going to learn a lot. And surprise all your friends at the next cocktail party with your geeky knowledge. Because um, most people never heard about this. And it's not terrible not to hear about this. It's just a shame. It's like you, know, you went all your life to, you know, knowing that there's real numbers, but never heard about the complex numbers, or the square root of minus 1 being i, or something like that. Or, or worse, maybe you went all through your life thinking the rationals are all there is, and never heard about the reals. It's just a shame, and it's it, it, disempowering. So, so now you know. Question. Ah, uh, the surreals don't have an i. So even i, that's the square root of minus 1, ain't there. Until you define the surcomplex numbers, in which case it's an a plus bi, where a and b are surreal, not just real, and now you got it. And now that subsumes both. So yes, it's a very good question. And if you asked that question about 100 years ago, he would have invented a whole new number system by himself. That would be good. And then he would be on the slides, too. Good. Should give you extra credit for, for asking that question. Excellent. It means you're thinking. What else? So the circumplexes subsume both the surreals and the complexes. And, it, and of course, now you can have surquaternions and suroctanians and surcedentians, too. And there's lots of stuff beyond that. This is not the end of it. So now you know there's a bigger picture. Now you can see the bigger picture in terms of just number systems. How many knew all this before? Oh, oh, my gift to you. No need to thank me. That's why we're here. And then there's things outside that. So for example, there's countable numbers. And then there's finitely describable numbers, numbers that have a finite description. That's not to say that they don't go indefinitely in decimal notation. That's the infinite description in decimal notation, but that's just one type of description. In another way to describe them is finitely, like saying pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. There, I've just described pi in a finite way, because I stopped put a decimal point. Now you know what number I'm talking about, pi, uniquely, unambiguously. So pi and e and square root of 2 all have finite descriptions. Never mind that in decimal notation, you have to go out arbitrarily far. So these are finitely describable numbers. And then there's numbers which are not finitely describable. Okay? And, and some of these numbers here, down here, are not finitely describable. So in fact, there are real numbers right here which are not finitely describable because that's oval, this is the oval, the Venn diagram region of the finitely describable numbers. And here there's real numbers in purple that are not finitely describable. So you can actually prove this, that some real numbers are not finitely describable. There's no way to finitely describe them. And pi is not one of them, and square root of 2 is not one of them, and e is not one of those. Those are finite descriptions. That's pretty amazing. So right now, I wish I could prove this to you, but we don't have enough infrastructure yet. But we will in a couple of weeks, or in about two or three lectures. So we'll come back and prove this theorem very soon. We'll talk about Cantor and try to find other arithmetic and infinite numbers, infinite quantities, infinite sets. And that's a very subtle and interesting and cool subject as well. And some finitely describable numbers are not computable. It means even though they're finitely describable, there's no algorithm to spit out their digits ever. It doesn't exist. It doesn't not exist because it's too complicated to write down right now or produce in C in under a million lines of code or some other type of mundane restriction like that. It simply doesn't exist as an algorithm. And that's, we're going to prove this theorem also very soon when we talk about Turing in a few lectures. Right now, we're not quite there in terms of the mental infrastructure necessary to argue these kind of theorems. But in a couple of weeks, we will. Now, any questions or comments about any of this? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, they have, they have some applications. Uh, and for extra credit, look them up and you tell me. Look at the wiki page. They have a whole wiki page and it's very long. Uh, in fact, there's a novel by Knuth, by Donald Knuth, uh, about surreal numbers. So he, Knuth actually popularized them back in the 70s. They're invented by John Harton Conway of Princeton, a very famous mathematician. He also invented the game of life, by the way, cellular automata. Um, and Knuth then popularized by writing a little novella, it's like maybe you know, 80 or 100 pages long, in terms of a fictional story between characters introducing to the reader what surreal numbers are, what the applications are, how they're defined, how, how multiplication is defined, division, subtraction, addition, exponentiation, all these are well-defined operations. And, for, and, and I think I have on the, on the website a link to that. So for extra credit, you can read Knuth's little novel. It's really fun and cool and re relatively easy to understand because it's not heavy on the math. It's fun, cool exposition using dialogue and characters. So that's, that's uh, what you can do to follow up on that. Good question. All right. Uh, so we talked about talking about complex numbers, exponentiation of complex numbers. What's the value of i to the i? How many worked on this problem? You raise i to the i's power, what do you get? Uh, it's an extra credit opportunity. So you know, I will just knock off that one right here. Hey, anybody know? I mean, you looked it up at least, or how many remember this problem for a lecture or two ago? OK, so I'm not crazy when I think I mentioned it. OK, good. Uh, so it turns out that it's about 0.2. Uh, and more specifically, it's, uh, it's 1 over square root of e to the pi. That's what i to the i is. So it's a real number, actually. And it's not just that value. It's multi-valued, because I, e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. It's a sinusoidal repeated um, multi-valued uh, quantity. So if you add here to the pi, 2k pi, you're basically making more and more complete cycles around the unit circle. And the sine and cosine don't change. Every 2 pi period, the values are the same with sine and cosine. So i to the i is really a lot of values, not just one. It's all of these. This is just a principal one where, where k is 0. Um, is it strange for an exponentiation to have more than one answer? How many think it's odd or haven't seen that before? How many have seen it before? When? When is an exponentiation have more than one answer? Give me an example. Yeah, so 4 to the 1 half, it's a real to a real, and the answer is plus or minus 2. Which one? Well, it's both. Plus 2 does the job, minus 2 does the job too. They're both square to 4. So it's not strange, except that this one has more than two answers. It has an infinity of answers. That's OK. It happens. Uh, all right. George Boole, early 1800s, mid 1800s, uh, was a philosopher, mathematician, invented basically what we now call Boolean logic, named after him. And the Boolean algebra that goes with it, including how these Boolean relations interact and how they affect each other and how they're, com they're composed with each other and how they can be used as building blocks to create more complicated Boolean formula and so on. And he wrote a treatise called Investigation to the Laws of Thought where he presented all of this very systematically about 150 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. Of course, today all computers are based on this. They're all based on Boolean logic where there's only two values. He's the first guy that said, you know, to have a useful algebra, you don't need an infinity of values like the integers or the reals or the rationals. You can have just two values and still do very useful math with just two quantities and that's it. He's the first guy in history that said that. It's brilliant. And now all computers are based on this. Computers just use internally two values, on or off, yes or no, true or false, zero or one. It's Boolean, named after him. What's another advantage? of having computers based on Boolean logic other than it just simplifies stuff, because there's only two things you have to worry about, 0 and 1. What's another more even practical, useful advantage to having just two quantities instead of 17 or 1,000? Because computers used to be analog. Back in the early 1900s or early 20th century, <coughs> um, you had analog computers that can take on any number of values of, you know, in terms of represented as voltages or currents or capacitances or whatever. And, even today, we have analog computers here and there, various guises. Um, but most of them are digital. Why digital? Why 0 and 1 
is better than 17 values. Yeah. Yeah, noise. So somebody else, explain what, what, what does he mean about the noise? Yeah. So any kind of small noise that gets injected into a 0, 1 situation will slightly alter the 0 to something above 0, or slightly lower the 1 to something below 1, or a little higher than 1 even. But it'll be very obvious that this happened, because it'll still be close to either 0 or 1. You'll, you'll need a heck of a lot of noise to make a 1 a 0 or a 0 or 1, because it has to go all the way across the spectrum of two extreme values. <clears throat> so it's uh, almost uh, you get automatic noise cancellation, or noise detection, or noise correction, error correction. So the circuits become more resilient, more robust, more error correction capable, and less resilient to noise and electrical disturbances and gamma rays hitting it and thermal fluctuations and that kind of thing. They become much more robust. And that's why our computers are so reliable. Think about it. There's trillions of things that happen in any given minute on your computer, you know, billions of things per second. And it rarely makes an error. I mean, usually the errors are your errors. You type in something wrong, or that's, that doesn't count. It doesn't make errors by itself. And that's because of this phenomenon noise cancellation because it's only 0 and 1. If the computer used internally a thousand different values you're presenting, every time one of those jittered a little bit, it'll be equal to another value, and you, you couldn't tell the difference. And you couldn't do anything to correct it. And these errors will propagate and cascade and run out of control on you. And computers won't be very reliable. All because of this guy. So we, we owe him a lot. And the influence, everybody that came after him, including Shannon and the Morgan and all the others, and Turing himself. Right? So it's hard to overestimate you know, the impact of his work. Uh, your mileage may vary on some of his cartoons. You know, binary Sudoku, not that interesting. But, uh. So the Morgan was one of his contemporaries. And he took Boole's ideas and ran with them even further. He developed mathematical induction, the thing I told you not to use. Um, but also logic on top of that, and manipulation, and De Morgan's law is named after him. What's De Morgan's law? In one sentence, what is De Morgan's law? Yeah. So the negation of an and is the or of the negations, or vice versa. And you can also couch it in the set theory. The complement of a union is what? The intersection of the complements, and vice versa. The complement of the intersection of two sets is the union of their complements. And for the same reason, these theorems apply. So these are the Morgan's laws. And he basically invented relational algebra uh, based on logic and uh, Boole's ideas of Boolean algebra, and studied paradoxes of all kinds. and. Uh, you know, Charles Babbage, again, a contemporary of both of them, <coughs> he took all of their ideas and implemented it as a big machine, a physical machine. Remember, they did their stuff in theory. They wrote down theorems. They proved things. They created the algebra, the Boolean algebra that underlines, that underlies all of that. But he actually created a machine that implements these ideas as a mechanism, as a device. And it's hard to overestimate that twist on the contribution. Right? So he was basically a mechanical engineer, and he had to be, because these devices weren't just like Swiss watches. They were like Swiss watches that would fill a room that had thousands and tens of thousands of gears, not just a few. And he's one of the fathers of computing or computer science. And he built the first mechanical computer that was, that was general. Remember the Antikythera, the one that the Greeks built at 200, 300 BC, 2,000 years earlier than this. It was a nice little calculator with gears and predicted eclipses and so on, did some calculations. But it wasn't a general machine. It couldn't do arbitrary computations. This one could, the ones that he, that, that Babbage designed. And the first was called the Difference Engine, 1822. And it looked like this. It's actually pieces of it with the gears and the levers and the ratchet and pinion, uh, rack and pinion mechanisms and the ratchets and so on. And it was programmable. L later, he, he invented a, a more sophisticated device, even called an analytical engine, which may made it fully programmable. It had even ways to code it using punched cards. Realize, this, we're talking about the 1830s here. This is before electricity was discovered. Uh, electric motors did not exist yet, because we haven't discovered electricity yet. 
there were no light bulbs. People worked to candlelight. And he was building computers that were arbitrarily powerful, or at least designing them and building prototypes. Um, he also, he, he was also an economist, and he developed the principle of division of labor, and um, that's kind of interesting in of itself. But here's more about his design. So 1822, the difference engine, it looked like this, it was, you know, the size of a small room, like several refrigerator type, you know, size back to back, had tens of thousands of parts, 15 tons, eight feet tall, 31 digits of precision, decimal digits. So maybe, you know, almost like a 64-bit kind of device. And it used a decimal number system and a hand crank. So this crank here was used to power that thing. You would crank in your answer and out will crank out the other side. Your, you know, you would crank in your inputs and out will crank the answer after a lot of motion of these gears and pulleys. And see here are some schematics and proofs of concept and small pieces of it and registers from it and so on from this, from this Diffus engine. These animations sort of show how they operate, basically like Swiss watches. Gears rotating against each other and doing computations along the way. And here, you know, you don't have to implement it using parts like here. Here is the one implemented from Mechanical, you can implement it from Lego. You can implement it any way you want, right? Uh, it's, when we get to the discussion universality of computation, you'll see that there's lots and lots of ways to implement computers. In fact, you can implement computers using chemicals and proteins. Anybody can give me an example of a computer that's based on chemicals and proteins? That's pretty sophisticated, actually. We are. Look in the mirror, you'll see a pretty good one. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways to implement computers. It doesn't have to be gears and pulleys. It doesn't have to be metal or silicon. It can be goo, proteins, organic compounds, and, and everything in between. We'll talk more about that at great length some future lecture. So here's this analytical engine, or at least pieces of it. Uh, this one was Turing complete. It can do any arbitrary computation that you want. It was fully programmable. It had a CPU. It used key punch cards, or punched cards in general. It had an arithmetic logic unit. It had microcode. It can do loops, and it had a printer. Think about that one. This thing had a printer attached to it. First of all, why would you need a printer? Output. If you didn't have a printer, the wheels would turn. The answers would show on the wheels. But the, if you don't record them, you wouldn't know what they were. So the printer would print them out on paper, and then you'd have a record of what the answers were. Remember, there were no screens, and CRTs, and televisions, and terminals, and none of that. Electricity wasn't invented yet. Remember, this is mid-1800s, early 1800s, actually. So the printer couldn't work on electricity. The printer was mechanical also, using its own gears and pulleys and levers and so on. And it could multiply two 20-digit numbers in three minutes, which was, you know, orders of magnitude faster than a human can do it. And it did it with absolute accuracy. I mean, human would make mistakes. So that was pretty good, right? So it had a cycle time of roughly three minutes. The cycle time of your iPhone in your pockets, you know, is a billion operations per second, actually more, because it's got multiple threads going on and so on. So, you know, your iPhone is like a trillion times faster than this. But still, for the time, this was phenomenal. Um, and uh, this particular one was so complex that he never finished building the whole thing. It would have occupied entire buildings, and the strengths of materials weren't strong enough to actually implement everything in mechanical ways, because when you have enough gears in a series, if you turn one you know, too much, you'll have stresses on the material, and metal can bend as opposed to just turning all the gears. Anyway, there were some mechanical issues, but the design was vetted very recently and shown to be correct. If it was implemented. So we, we implemented this in simulations and even in, in, in mechanical ways, parts of it at least. And he was right on the money. His, 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 his design had no flaws in it, amazingly enough. Question was question. Years. Yeah. Yeah, it was a breakthrough. It was a, more of a proof of concept. It was a prototype. So it's not like it was marketing it and selling copies to companies and to governments, although it probably could have, if they understood why this is important. Remember, most people at that time, electricity wasn't even invented yet, uh, they didn't even understand 
why you would need a computer. They realize you can do computations a little, you know, considerably faster than human, but the average person couldn't, couldn't explain to you for the life of them why that's important, significant, or impactful. Uh, even today, people have trouble understanding the power of computers. Uh, they think it's just another device. It's not another device. It's the last device we'll ever have to build once it becomes artificial intelligence. Intelligence, because it'll start building its successors. It's an extremely general thing, different than any other device. Also, it's universal, right? Um, so, you know, carpenters don't need a telescope, and doctors, you know, don't need a particle accelerator, and uh, you know, plumbers don't need a microscope. But all these people need computers every hour of every day of their lives. Think about that. Computers are the universal cross-cutting device that everybody needs. We, you all have ones on your desk or in your pockets, no exception. Some of them have several on you at all times. Right? And this is the guy who built the first general one um, and showed that it's even possible. Before that, we didn't even know it was possible. Right? And here are some more models and prototypes and pieces of it and so on. All mechanical, beautifully designed in the early 1800s. And here's the printer, the mechanical printer that he designed too. And here's an example of its output. All working mechanically. No motors, no electricity. Still works flawlessly. So basically, uh, it's amazing what you can do with mechanical means only. And he just mastered that, that art. So he gets a huge moon crater named after him. And even today, there is the Babbage Institute that still examines and researches all of these contributions. We're still not completely uh, wrapping our heads around everything he did because we're still discovering new things that he did that were more obscure and less obvious. And there's a whole line of researchers that still investigates his stuff and archives his papers and the impact of his papers on others. Which brings us to uh, Countess Ada Lovelace. Um, she was the daughter of Lord Byron, the famous poet and uh, playwright. But De Morgan tutored her in math and logic, and she wrote the first computer program ever in human history for his device that he was building as a model. And uh, so she's essentially the world's first programmer. And this is, again, early 1800s, 1820s, 1830s. And she saw the huge potential of computers, one of the very first ones. Uh, Babbage himself called her the, en the enchantress of numbers, uh, maybe because he possibly had a crush on her, I don't know, and you know, who wouldn't, you know, that was pretty good of her to uh, be so advanced and so insightful at a time where the world was relatively backwards. And uh, she gets a lot of credit for, for what she did. And there's even movies about her, and plays and books. Uh, she became a cover girl of Computer Weekly, that was more recent. And uh, lots and lots of books on her contributions and uh, the importance of her insights. So there's even the Lovelace Medal that is awarded every year to people. And Tim Barners Lee, the inventor of the web uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, got the Lovelace Medal for his contribution, which because of him, we have a web and websites and web browsers. And so that's pretty good. So let me show you what she said specifically. Um, so this is an example of her program. She, this, this one of her programs to compute Bernoulli, Bernoulli numbers. And it was correct. You know, there's no programming languages, per se. This is a program for that device that Babbage has built. So it was very special purpose. But still, a, a nice general program to compute things. And that's basically her own creation and her own manuscript right out of there. And I want to show you some of her own words, what she actually said in her manuscript. Um, so she said, we may say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just like the loom weaves flowers and leaves, creating patterns in cloth. Uh, and the loom was recently invented then too, which was a, which was a big deal. Um, and she said, these are direct quotes from her manuscript. She said, again, it might act upon other things besides numbers. Right? Abstract science of operations. She talked about notation. She talked about the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So she predicted that one day computers will produce and play music, which was, again, a phenomenal, radical thing to say in the early 1800s. 
and more quotes by her. You know, she talked about people who are not conversant with mathematical studies may imagine that the, this engine could result in numerical notation only and blah, blah, blah. She said, this is an error. The engine can arrange and combine numerical quantities exactly as if they were letters or general symbols. So she talked about this machine as a general symbol manipulator, not just a calculator of numbers and quantities. Again, a brilliant insight for the early 1800s. And even for today, it's not trivial. If you have a circuit full of Boolean gates, and it can play World of Warcraft with you, just from a bunch of Boolean gates stuck to pose together. It's hard to make that leap even today. And you have entire classes in digital logic showing you exactly how that happens. How you put together enough transistors, each of which is just Boolean or at and or not gate, you have arbitrary levels of complexity emerging. Right? And before you know it, these things can be creative and produce things, and, and produce movies even, like Toy Story and Avatar and things like that. But she realized very early on that this is possible. Right? And she said that very explicitly. And she talked about higher science of analysis and kind of ushered in alg you know, al algorithms in the field of programming and algorithmic thinking and so on. That was amazing. Uh, her original manuscript sold at uh, Christie's for some $170,000 a few years ago. And that shows you the, the impact. I don't know who bought it. Maybe it was anonymous. Uh, so uh, a, few, a few other extra credit problems. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared is c squared. So it holds with triangles, right? And here's an example of an animation of why the Pythagorean theorem is true. And here's a different proof. Again, using animation, you can sort of see how it goes. These two areas merge and morph into this area. There's the square of this side, the square of this side, and the square of that side. You know, so the exercise here is to come up with as many proofs as, as you can. So I'm showing you several different animated proofs. And the proofs are only animated, but there's hundreds of different proofs of the Pythagorean theorem, so come up with some new ones. And another one about the Pythagorean theorem, it's true about triangles when you square the sides. In other words, you put squares on all the sides whose the side of a square is commensurate with the side of a triangle. And the area of the two little squares together added up is equal to the area of the big square. That's the Pythagorean theorem. My question to you is, is that true for semicircles? If you put a semicircle on each side where the side becomes the diameter of a circle, is the Pythagorean theorem still true for, the sem for, for these two smaller semicircles? added up will equal in area the big semicircle. How many say yes, out of curiosity? How many say no? Split vote, interesting. So try to prove it one or the other. What if you put other similar figures, like stars or other arbitrary figures, which are still similar to one another, just different sizes, expanded, contracted? Does the Pythagorean theorem hold there or not? Uh, here's, a, here's a fun, quick one. You know, compute this number squared in your head. Don't use paper, don't use Google Calculator. Just stare at it and give me the answer. Here's another interesting one. Uh, compute the approximate value of this quantity. So these are exponentiations. Notice that, that, that all the digits appear there once. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are exponentiations. And here, you could try Google Calculator. You just won't get anywhere, because once you start exponentiating here, it's such a large number. Google's not going to help you with that. But try to think about what the value of this is. It's still quite doable. This is more extra credit bounties. Uh, does every closed simple curve contain the vertices of an equilateral triangle? So for example, I have an ellipse, and I can find three points under an ellipse that these three points together will make an equilateral triangle, a triangle of all equal sides. So I can do this for an ellipse. The question is, can I do it for an arbitrary shape, arbitrary closed simple shape that doesn't itself intersect? Can I, make, can I find three points on the heart that makes an equilateral triangle, or are these arbitrary polygons or shapes? So either prove that you can do this for every simple closed curve, or give me a counterexample where it can't be done. How many understand the statement of the problem, not the answer, the statement? OK, any questions about any of these? Yeah? Have to be on the line. Because if it didn't, you can easily find one small enough that it'll just fit inside. And then I wouldn't insult your intelligence with that version because it'd be too easy. So yeah, I think that's a very good question. The three points must lie on the, on the actual boundary of the curve. Other questions? <clears throat> no, and very good question. No, it doesn't. Some of the triangle will be outside the curve. 
So for example, here, one point could be here, another here, another here. And this area here that's external to the curve can still be inside the triangle. That's OK. <clears throat> um, so um, here's a simple closed curve. And of course, if you can prove it in general, it'll be true for this too. There's a triangle there. But the simple closed curve looks like something. It's not arbitrary. What does it look like? Any? I mean, I've actually seen the original painting. Where is it? The Louvre, yeah. So Da Vinci. So simple closed curves could be arbitrarily complex and interesting and beautiful and aesthetic. And again, they don't self-intersect. And you can draw them without lifting your pen off the paper. And the question is, how would you produce this algorithmically? If I give you a picture, an image, a photograph, can you come up with a piece of code, an algorithm, a program, that would produce from that image a simple closed curve that resembles the original image. Think about algorithmically how that would happen. Here's another cool one. Where does this one appear? Christine Chapel, right? Who's the artist? Michelangelo. So how do you take an arbitrary image and algorithmically transform it to a simple closed curve? So this could be a cool project for extra credit. You don't have to do this, but if you do this, you'll learn a lot of good stuff. You'll be able to amaze your friends with the images you produce. You can produce one for your loved ones or you know, parents or whoever that makes a great Christmas gift once you put it on the poster. And they'll know that you didn't get it on eBay because it's customized to them. It looks like them. Right? So a uh, very nice gift. Um, who's the artist here? Andy Warhol. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's also a tomato soup can from Campbell's, but still. Uh, and you might ask you know, things like, a given point inside, if I put a point somewhere, is it inside or outside the curve? Because the curve has an interior and has an exterior, just like a circle, except that's much more complicated than a circle, because it's all convoluted and contorted. So uh, it's hard to tell if a point is internal or external. But think about what an algorithm would be to determine for an arbitrary simple closed curve, and given a point to determine whether it's inside or outside the region determined by the curve. And it becomes easier once you paint the inside with a color. So here I'm painting the inside with red. Now it's much more obvious. Because if you have a point here, it's outside. But if I have a point there on the red, it's inside. Because the inside is all painted with a single color. But algorithmically, how will that work? Think about that. Okay. So again, the, the project is to take arbitrary images, somehow algorithmically convert them to simple closed curves that resemble the images. You can even incorporate color into it if you want. It doesn't have to be all black and white. If you use colors, it's even more dramatic because the colors correspond. It looks even more photorealistic at the end. And you're going to learn a lot about algorithms efficiency and traveling salesman tours and uh, heuristics and lots of good stuff. So it, it, this, this project encompasses a lot of things. Again, it's extra credit. If you don't want to do it, it's your choice. But if you do it, you'll learn a lot. I'll be impressed. And you'll be uh, very impressive, too, when you demo it to your friends and loved ones. Extra bonus. All right, brings us to John Venn. Uh, basically, he invented modern set theory. Uh, also a logician, a philosopher. Uh, and before him, sets were just kind of nebulous things that people talked about intuitively. But he formalized and made the whole thing rigorous, the study of sets and their interactions and their intersections and unions and complements and um, their study in general. So sets are used almost everywhere. They're as ubiquitous as graphs, but probably even more so. Uh, they're used in every field of human endeavor. So we already saw several sets and Venn diagrams. Right? So this generalized numbers that we just saw half an hour ago is an example of a Venn diagram where you have set containments of certain number systems containing other number systems, subsume them, proper containments. We already mentioned the Chomsky hierarchy, which is sort of the touchstone image for this whole course. We, you know, we, we already uh, talked about regular languages and finite automata a couple, of, you know, a week or two ago, and we'll talk more about these other uh, regions here. But this is one big Venn diagram. It's set containments all the way out, and some are proper, some are not known to be proper, others, uh, you know, contain each other and so on. So uh, sets occur lots and lots of places. Here's a set Venn diagram that shows you the relation of all the British and United Kingdom regions to one another, including Scotland and Ireland and so on. And uh, you can have arbitrarily convoluted Venn diagrams. Here's a Venn diagram of four regions, and all possible regions of inter mutual intersections 
are actually represented there as non-empty regions. And you can extend this construction to an arbitrary number of sets. Uh, and again, John Venn pioneered all of that. And here's an alternate construction uh, of showing you several different sets and all their possible unions and intersections uh, represented as separate regions. So the number of regions grows very quickly exponentially because that's how many subsets you can have. And uh, you can generalize this to some particular types of shapes and fix the shapes. And there's lots and lots of variations on Venn diagrams. There's rotationally symmetric Venn diagrams, which each region is a complete simple rotation of all the other regions. Otherwise, they're congruent. And it turns out you can do that trick with arbitrarily large number of regions. Here it is for eight regions. And here it is for 11 regions. Each one of these regions looks like this. This is one of the 11 regions here, all rotated 2 pi over 11 to show you all the possible intersections. And, and now there's a lot of them. There's, you kind of start to lose track visually, but they're all there. Uh, there's something called area proportional Venn diagrams, where the areas of the diagram are proportional to the size of the regions and how many elements they contain. So here's the same diagram as here, except here, regions which have a lot of, num a lot of uh, elements and regions which have few elements have the same size. And that's a bit misleading. Here, it's area proportional, which is much more instructive and illuminating when you look at it visually. Because now you can tell that this region only contains a few elements, and this region contains more elements. This region contains a lot more elements. And their, their areas are, are proportional to the number of elements. So it turns out you can do that under many circumstances, and that's a good way to present information, and so on and so on. So I'm showing you variations on the Venn diagrams. It's, it's a huge, deep field of study. It's not just simple diagrams. It's, that we've you just seen before in most places. There's um, symmetric Venn diagrams. There's uh, uh, polygonal or polynomial. Polynomial is kind of Venn diagrams where all the regions are square or rectangular. Uh, there's ones that are painted on the surface of a more complex manifold than a plane, like a sphere or hypersphere or hyperboloid or other manifolds. And then there's, there's little fun and games with Venn diagrams. The Venn diagram humor, um, and uh, you can actually have jokes that are made up of Venn diagrams. I'm showing you a few here. Uh, so, for example, uh, the ironic truth about Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams showing you how funny things are or are not. That's one set, and things that are actually funny and are disjoint. So, and yet you laugh, which means they're not really disjoint, are they? So. You know, there's interesting little se senses of humor displayed there. One of my favorite, a Venn diagram during the Bush administration showing all the constitutional crises that happened, you know, the firing of the Department of Justice people, the course of investigation, course of invest interrogation techniques like waterboarding, the CIA tapes, wiretapping, and the intersection of all of them is, is Dick Cheney. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Of course, nowadays we see how good we had it with George Bush, but I, I digress. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. I couldn't help it. Uh, so uh, your, your mileage may vary, but these are all kind of amusing uh, ways to express humor using Venn diagrams. So it's kind of the funny side of Venn diagrams. All right, Charles Dodgson, also known as Lewis Carroll. So uh, he was a mathematician. He was a serious mathematician. But most of his contributions are known to people in terms of the books that he popularized. Um, that he wrote and became very, very popular, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And um, that became so popular that it kind of went viral in the 1800s. And his mathematics were, were kind of took a back seat almost to his, to his children's books. When the Queen of England read Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, she was so enamored with the tales that she asked him to dedicate his next book uh, to, to her. And he agreed, except his next book was a treatise on determinants. So we dedicated that to the Queen, sent her a copy. I'm not sure she appreciated uh, linear algebra as much as she did uh, Alice in Wonderland, but uh, he did what she said, so can't argue with that. He also invented the, the game of Scrabble, interestingly enough, that most of you have, have played, and also the game of word ladder. But he profoundly influenced science and math forever because these books, as silly as they may seem on a surface level, were actually very deep treatises about logic and semantics. And I'll show you an example in a second. And kids would read this book and get very intrigued. Um, and so for example, uh, through the looking glass, the whole book describes a big chess game. And the characters are chess pieces. The red queen, the white knight. And they move around on a big chessboard. 
And kids, of course, it's hard to expect them to appreciate all that. Even adults, it's not obvious to them either. But if you follow the moves of all the characters around, it's playing a master, a grandmaster level chess game with the characters, among other things, including the funny and cute dialogues and so on. So it gets a lot of credit for turning kids on to math and science and logic. And they got so intrigued that they became scientists, and magicians, and mathematicians over the years, just starting out by reading his books and getting kind of sucked into all the intricacies of what went on in those books. And you can read them at several different levels. So here are some of the original etchings from the book. You know, so you got Alice, you got the Dormouse, you got the Dodo, uh, you got Tweedledee and Tweedledum, you got you know, the Walrus and the Carpenter, uh, of course, the March Hare, the Mad Hatter. These are all characters directly from his book, right? Um, the Griffin, the Cheshire Cat, and he goes on and on. So this is just some of the original etchings. And through a looking glass, more iconic characters that we know and love today. And that's where they came from, the Red Queen and the White Knight. Here's the ch chess board. It looks like a field, but it's really a, a real chess board if you look at it through the right lens. Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Here's the Walsh and the Carpenter. Um, and uh, Humpty Dumpty with his great fall sitting on a wall. And uh, so that's a, some, some of the characters and icons from his book. But more pertaining to logic and semantics, you know, let me show you some of the impact. And this, by the way, these books have been made into many, many movies, over, many times over. Right? So there's literally dozens and dozens of renditions of these books as movies. Here are just some of them. Some were animated, some were Disney, some are not Disney. Some were actually black and white back way in the day. You know, sound, soundless, silent movies. And one of the most recent ones, of course, the latest incarnation from Disney with uh, Johnny Depp playing the Mad Hatter, Tim Burton uh, directing. And now we have a sequel to that, made over a billion dollars each. So it's still very, very popular today after 150 years. But here's what I mean by semantics and subtle undercurrents of what's in his book. So I'll give you an example. So here's an excerpt. So the, knight, the white knight is talking to Alice. And he says, you are sad. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. And she says, it's very long. And he says, it's long, but it's very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears it, either it brings tears into their eyes, or else, or else what, said Alice, or else it doesn't. So law of the exclude the middle, binary, like bull, yes or no. Either it does or it doesn't. So that's kind of embedded in that logic there. And he says, the name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. And she says, oh, that's the name of the song, is it? And he says, no, no, you don't understand. <clears throat> that's what the name is called. He did say the name of the song is called. The name really is the aged, aged man. He says, okay, then I ought to have said what the song is called. That's what the song is called. And he says, no, no, that's quite another thing altogether. The song is called Ways and Means. But that's only what it's called, you know. And she says, then what is the song then? He says, well, that's a different matter altogether. I'm coming to that. The song really is a sitting on a gate. So what's going on here? Let's, let's draw it out. So... The song is a sitting on a gate, but what it's called is ways and means. So the song is this, but it has a name, and that's, the, so, so the song is called that. But the song also has a name, and the name is this blue thing, color-coded to the text. But the name is called something else, so the name has a name. That's okay. Objects could be called with other objects, right? Object is just a name, and a name could have a name. So a name could have a name as well, and a name of the name could still have another name. So this is indirection. This is like pointers, a pointer to a pointer. So this is sort of a dagger of what's going on in this text. Here's the song. Here's what it's called. Here's its name. And here's what the name is called as a separate matter altogether. Now, if you're a seven-year-old reading this book, this might get lost on you the first reading. But it'll intrigue you, and it's kind of cutesy. And when you get to be 10 or 12, you read it again, and then you begin to realize this. All of a sudden, you know something about semantics, and about logic, and about philosophy. And those are very deep subjects. And then you read more about it before you know it, you're a mathematician or a scientist. And that's a good thing. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, well, oh, well uh, I don't know that there isn't. Let's put it that way. I, I couldn't tell you what there is uh, significant to the actual strings here that he chose. There probably is some subtle thing about it. Uh, but that's another thing to investigate. See, I mean, that intrigued you. Now I'm intrigued, and maybe I'll look it up. And you see, I'm going through the same process as these seven-year-olds, trying to find out more about it. Uh, so it's hard to overestimate uh, this, this stuff. So he was talking about pointers and pointers to pointers. 
you know, a good 100 years plus before computers were invented. And we're actually doing this in code, right? And he's, called, he's talking about dereferencing. Meta pointers are getting dereferenced. Separation of abstraction, variable versus pointer, right? Because you have something, and then you have something pointing to that something. So that's like call by value and call by name. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You have a subroutine, you can call by value, call by name. And that's kind of embedded in this subtext, you know, the notion of value of something and the name of that something. But it's not its value, it's just the name of the value. So it's like variables in, in a piece of code, actually. So you can call by name, you can call by value, and you can do other ways too. Um, so semantics is a very deep subject. And once you start thinking about semantics, you begin to realize how informally people speak and how, ma how many errors of semantics are in colloquial speech. You know, so when you say something like, you know, it says semantics here on the door, a classroom in which meanings are discussed. And then it says, more precisely, it's just a door. The classroom is on the other side of the door. So this door is not the classroom, and neither is the label the, the, the classroom. Uh, and when you start to think about it and analyze it, you begin to speak with higher and higher precision um, and think with higher and higher precision, which is even better. Uh, maybe fake news won't sway you so much if you start doing that as a rule. Anyway, there's entire societies um, that are dedicated to his work, even to this day. Uh, it's quite amazing. Um, so uh, the Alice program that Randy Pausch wrote, how many see the last lecture of time management by Randy Pausch? He was my friend and mentor. And his system called Alice, after Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, is designed to help five and seven and eight year olds to program, including girls. Um, so it's very hard to get little kids to program unless they're somehow primed to it already, except that this system draws them in because of the Alice motif and it allows you to storyboard things and use characters very easily. So you don't have to use a lot of code to storyboard and have characters interact and do things and create animations. So kids start using the system to tell stories to other kids and in the process of it, they had to code a little bit and be a little bit of programmers, and that drew them in, and later they became serious computer scientists. So Randy sort of followed the footsteps of Lewis Carroll and used humor and cutesiness to get kids to think like scientists. And that's, that's always a good thing. So this brings us to Jörg Cantor. So Basically, he created modern set theory and, even more importantly, invented the field of transfinite arithmetic. He's the first person in human history to argue and prove, even, that uh, not all infinities are created equal. Some infinities are bigger than others. And in, in, the first, uh, pro in the first problem set, there's a number of questions about that. And now we're going to get into more details about it. So he invented the arguments of diagonalization and one-to-one -one correspondences, very, very powerful arguments. We'll use them again and again. We're going to get lots of mileage out of each one of these, diagonalization and one-to-one -one correspondences. He uh, showed us an infinite hierarchy of infinities, each one bigger than the previous, in a very strict mathematical sense. It wasn't just hand-wavy. Because up to him, uh, you know, up to his time, people thought that all infinities are created equal. Infinity is something that's just bigger than anything else, and one infinity is the same as any other infinity. They're all just huge. Uh, but he said, no, some are much bigger than others. He was able to prove it, and we will prove it right here, beginning today, actually. So um, he invented uh, lots of theorems about it and types of sets that were pretty amazing. He laid the foundation for all computer science theory, which in turn laid the foundation for the rest of computer science. Influenced Hilbert and Gödel and Church and Turing and many others, and he gets a lot of credit for that. So here are just some books about his contributions. And if you can only read one of them, I would say read this one. This is, uh, I, in fact, I think that's one of the required readings. A relatively short book informal, not a whole lot of deep math in it, except very, very cool ideas about infinities, of which we'll cover some here. And the rest you can pick up from this book for fun and profit. Uh, so people around his time uh, thought it was even sacrilegious to analyze and mathematically prove things about infinity. They equated infinity with the divine. So they said anybody that even tries to analyze it is, is automatically a heretic. And uh, his work was shunned during his lifetime. He, he had trouble getting published. He, people thought his ideas were crazy. Um, and only many decades later did he get, the, after he, he was dead, uh, in fact, uh, in the later part of his life, he kind of went crazy and depressed and uh, ended up in an insane asylum for the remainder of his life. Only decades later did we recognize how brilliant and genius his work was. 
and how influential and fundamental it is and how everything else in computer science builds on top of that, as we'll see as the lectures progress. Uh, Hilbert was instrumental in popularizing his work. So uh, it wasn't just him. Um, and in the book, you can read about some of his ideas on page 176. It shows you dovetailing and one-to-one -one correspondences and diagonalization on page 174. So this is right in the book, in our own very, tech, our very own textbook for this course. And we use it all over the place. So here's a little bit of what he's done. So you have an infinite hotel, infinite number of rooms, numbered one, two, three, four, all the way up. And all the rooms are full. Each hotel room has a guest in it that's occupying that room. And you have a new guest coming in the lobby that wants a room. You're the hotel manager. What do you do? How do you accommodate this new guest that comes in the room, that comes into the lobby and wants a room, and all the hotel rooms are full, but there's an infinity of them? What do you do as a hotel manager? Yeah. Yeah, very good. So you move the first guest to the second room, the second guest to the third room, and so on. Everybody moves one down, and that frees up the first room. And the new guest goes into the first room. Everybody's happy. So infinite hotel is really good business, because you can always accommodate more guests. Right? You never run out of rooms in some sense. And they can all do this in parallel, so you know, no big deal. And mathematically, it's just a simple function. f of n is equal to n plus 1. Right? If you're in room number n, you're moving to room number n plus 1. That's your rule, very simple rule. Everybody applies it all at once. How many get this? Good. So let's take it to the next level. Now it's an infinity of guests. Infinite number of guests come in the lobby, all wanting rooms. Not just one, but countable infinity. First guest, second guest, third guest, fourth guest. How do you accommodate this new infinity of guests? Let's have people who haven't participated yet today. You know, it's a rush. You'll feel the adrenaline going. And no matter what you say, you get points for courage if you speak up. So it's automatic win. So what can be better than that? Anybody? Yeah, back there. Yeah, you can move every guest to twice its room number. So one goes to two, two goes to four, three goes to six, four goes to eight. Once you do that, that frees up all the odd rooms. And all these guys, they go into the odd rooms. Room number one, three, five, seven, and so on. So the function is simply now f of n is equal to 2n. You go to twice your room number, pretty straightforward. And all the odd ones get freed up. The new guests go in. Everybody's happy. So nice trick. You know, it's too bad you can't do this with regular hotels. Otherwise, the hotel industry would be really, really good business. All right, let's take it up a level. Uh, now, it's not just one infinity of guests, but there's a second infinity of guests, a third infinity of guests. There's an infinity of infinities. There's an infinity of lines of guests in the room. Each line is infinitely long. What do you do now? Somebody new. Somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Yeah. Dovetail. Somebody else explain what he means by dovetail. He's right. If you can answer something in one, one, one word, you win. Uh, but somebody else explains it a little bit better for the rest of the class, a little more detailed. What does it mean by dovetailing? Yeah. So basically, number the guests. You know, this, this guest gets number one, maybe. This, gets, this guest gets number two. And number three, and number four, and number five, and number six. So you basically kind of dovetail. You snake, you snake around all the lists of all the, all the lines of all the guests. You never go one line down all the way to the end for two, for two good reasons. One is if you go one and number them one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to the end, you'll run out of numbers, and you'll never have any numbers to number these guys. And by the way, these red, line, these red numbers are the, are the room numbers. So each one now has a unique integer, and they go to that room. Of course, you have to empty the room first. So all these guests are originally in the rooms. You put them in one more line. So this real first line is really all the guests from all the rooms a priori. Now you, all the rooms are empty. And then you number all the guests like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And these are the new room numbers. And I won't bother to write a formula for this, because it's a little bit complex, like a quadratic formula. It's not, that, it's not that bad. I just won't write it. But that's how you accommodate all the guests. And so why don't you number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way out? Because you'll run out of numbers. And another even better reason why you don't number the guests from the beginning, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, all the way to the end of the first line is because what? Give me a really good reason, subtle reason. 
the first line doesn't end. So when I said the end of the first line, what was I talking about? Nothing. I wasn't talking about anything. I was talking about something that doesn't exist, and so it doesn't count. It's like saying, consider the integer between a quarter and a third. Multiplied by 2, at 5, what do you get? Well, you can't answer that question. It's not because you can't multiply something or add something. It's because I said, consider the integer between a quarter and a third, and then, but already I was talking about something that doesn't exist. So you have nothing to work with, so end of story right there. So you can't go to the end of an infinite list, not because there's some technical difficulty in doing so, it's because the end doesn't exist. It ain't there. How many understand this? It's subtle. It's not hard if you think about it enough, but... Okay. Any questions about this? This is called dovetailing. There's many forms of dovetailing. This is an example of dovetailing. And, you know, um, there's a little cutesy video on the web, Hotel Infinity, kind of summarizing this kind of logic. And you can do this with things other than hotels, of course. This is what Cantor did. Question? Oh, oh you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. What you could have done is, first of all, uh, double them up, which will free up all the odd ones. And then here, this will go into the first odd one, the second odd one, the third odd one, and now you're just interlacing all these guys like that. There's many ways to do it. I just showed you one way, but you showed another way, and that's correct too, and there's lots of other ways to do it too. It's not unique kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's lots of ways to map an infinite set to another infinite set, but as long as it works. Because keep in mind, there's a lot of ways to map an infinite set to another infinite set that don't work, that create collisions of all kinds and create all sorts of issues and things left out of the one-to-one -one correspondence or the supposed one-to-one -one correspondence. So there's lots of ways to do it right. Just keep in mind, there's lots of ways to do it wrong, too. So, so not everything works, even though lots of things work. Okay. So, um, you know, the natural numbers are a strict subset of the integers. Why? Because Natural numbers don't have negatives in them, and integers do. And integers contain all the naturals. So naturals are a strict superset, excuse me, integers are a strict superset of the naturals, and conversely, naturals are a strict subset of the integers. But they're not the same set, because one has negatives and the other one doesn't. And so the question becomes, is there more of one than the other? And up to Cantor's time, people would say, oh yeah, there's more, because um, you know, integers contain all the naturals plus a whole bunch more. So that, that, that's bigger. And Cantor showed, no, it's not bigger. So one way to show it is very easy. Um, basically, you take all the integers, the negatives and the positives. The positives are in blue, negatives are in red. And you just rearrange them. And you can rearrange them lots of ways, but here's one way that works. You kind of split them up and you know, put, put the other ones in the middle. So basically, you interlace them, you zip them up like this. So each number is followed by its negative other than 0, because it's its own negative. And that's still the same as the integers, because they're all there. They just rearranged a little bit. Blue, white, blue, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, as opposed to only red and then only blue. Once you do that, you can just number them with natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and the naturals. And because it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, they must be the same cardinality. Cardinality is a generalized notion of size. You talk about size, you know, three cars, Three drivers, these are small sets, and three is the size of the set. Three cars, three drivers, that's fine. When it comes to integers, or infinite sets in general, you can no longer talk about normal sizes like three or infinity. It's a more generalized notion of cardinality, which includes infinities, and also finite sizes as well. So it's a more general way to count or express the magnitude of a set. So now these two sets have the same cardinality because you put them in one-to-one -one correspondence with one another. Because with finite sets, if you want to know if there's more cars than drivers or more drivers than cars, you say, well, I got three cars, three drivers, three is equal to three, so same number, so they're the same size set. Drivers, cars, three of each. Well, it's all fine and dandy, except when they become infinite. 
If you have an infinite number of cars, infinite number of drivers, you can no longer say three and three or Google and Google anymore because it's infinite. So how do you compare the sizes? Well, let's go back to three and three. Another way to represent the same number of cars and drivers, instead of counting and counting and compare the counts, forget counting. Just How long ago was it out, by the way? How, how long ago didn't you hear me? I oh, hope, hope it wasn't more than a minute or two. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, another more subtle example is whether there's more rational numbers than natural numbers. Because now if you saw one-to-one -one correspondences, how can things be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with something that's a strict subset of itself? Maybe you can do that for any arbitrary infinite sets. It turns out. Not so much, but sometimes you could still do it, and it's still kind of dovetailing, except a little more subtle. So are there more natural numbers than fractions? Because some fractions are natural numbers, like 4 over 2 is equal to 2. But 1 third and 4 thirds are fractions that are not natural numbers. So what we're going to do is put all the natural numbers in this big table. Right? So if you have x and y, it'll be y over x, red over blue. So 3 over 1 here, and you'll have uh, 4 over 2 here, and 7 over 2, and 3 over 3, and 3 over 4, and then you'll have 3 6 and 2 eighths, and so on. So all the fractions are in here. Right now, don't worry about the negative fractions. In a minute, you'll see how that, those fall into place very nicely. How many agree that all the fractions in the universe are there, at least the positive fractions? Because it's systematic. It's all of them. So what do you do in terms of dovetailing, how you put a one-to-one -one correspondence between these fractions and natural numbers? There's lots of ways to do it, but here's one way. You snake around in the serpentine path, and once you do that, you just number them like the infinite guests in the hotel. In fact, this is very much like the last example of the hotel with an infinite number of rows, infinite number of things in each. So once you have the serpentine dovetailing path, you just start numbering them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. And now, for every fraction here in the plane, you have a natural number in green that matches with it, and it's a perfect matching. All the naturals are in green. They're all there. None are missing, and there's no duplicates either. And all the fractions are there, too. And I just showed you how to put it into one-to-one -one correspondence, which means there's the same cardinality of natural numbers as there are fractions. No more, no less. Okay? And Cantor was the first human in history to to prove this. Right? And now we can all enjoy these discoveries and build on top of that. And this is called dovetailing, and we'll use dovetailing again and again for the rest of the course in all sorts of ways. We'll get a lot of mileage out of that technique. OK? How many get this? Good. Any questions? And there's lots of other ways to do it. There's also lots of other ways to do it wrong. So let's say you want to get rid of the duplicates, because 2 over 2 is the same as 1 over 1. So you can argue that this number and that number are the same number. 2 over 2 is 1, 1 over 1 is 1, 3 over 3 is 1. So there's a lot of duplication going on in terms of value, just not using um, the same notation or express expression. So how would you get rid of all these duplicates? 1 over 1, the same as 2 over 2. Well, when you get to it, don't number it, skip it. 
So this does not become number three. This becomes number three, and this one we forget about. Four, five, this one is a duplicate. Skip it. Make that one a six. And keep going, and just skip the duplicates. And now you have a one-to-one -one correspondence without any duplicates either. How many get this? Easy to do. Now, what if you wanted the negative numbers, the negative fractions in there too? How would you do that? Yeah, take the positives and negatives, interlace them like this, and just renumber the whole thing. End of story, like the infinite hotel. So now you can see you can play all sorts of cool tricks and combine these one to one correspondences to get you yet new ones. And in the exercises of problem set one, there's a lot of examples where you have to find one to one correspondences between sets and other sets, and it teaches you all sorts of ways to do it. So here, this one avoids duplicates. Okay? Now, why, and, and you can also do it this way. It didn't have to be this square serpentine path. It could have been just diagonalization, uh, diagonal kind of uh, dovetailing like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so there's lots and lots of ways to diagonalize, to, 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 uh, to form one-to-one -one correspondences. But there's also ways to, to not do it. So what if you work, go all the way to the end and number them like this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way to the end, and then number this, the next number, and the next number. Why doesn't that work? Because there ain't no end. And so you'll never get to this end, and you'll never get to this beginning, and this will forever remain unnumbered, so you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's ill-defined. Okay? We'll keep harping on this next time. Um, solve problems in set one having to do with cardinalities, one-to-one -one correspondences, dovetailing, and diagonalization. And we'll go deeper into all of that. I realized I didn't answer the questions at the bottom of the slide, like what approaches fail, what works. Oh, that's okay.